So um, we're now going to discuss um, the issues concerning sodium valparate. And um, we just would like to ask you some questions on that. Um, it's always been stated that um, valparate uh, should not be used as first-line therapy in pregnancies. And um, I'm just wondering when the department first became aware that this was being ignored uh, and what action has been taken. And we're talking about the, particularly the Pregnancy Prevention Programme, uh, which um, we really, all of us, I think, have tried to make sure that that's a foolproof um, program, but unfortunately it isn't. And we know even now that uh, some women are still um, taking sodium valparate uh, when they are um, of childbearing age and obviously it's to fight um, epilepsy. We know all that. Uh, but we just sort of wondered um, how we can instill it in a much, much stronger way um, and ensure that it's not being uh, ignored. Well, shall I, look, shall I run through the broad chronology to, to start with, Julia? So, I mean, as you said, it's an anti-epileptic that's been uh, available uh, since 1972. Um, in terms of harm, uh, it may cause birth defects and they were first apparent in 1974, and the advice then is to be used in severe cases. Obviously, as we touched on earlier, that was for doctors via the Committee of Safety of Medicines at the time, wasn't necessarily communicated to uh, the individual patient because that wasn't the way those information systems operated at the time and it was a popular anti-epileptic throughout the 70s and 80s. There were a number of warnings from the 80s onwards roughly about once every five or ten years about half a dozen um, that uh, continued to raise more seriously the issue of congenital malformations and uh, birth effects and latterly autism and these warnings led in 2014 to the EU uh, wide review led by the MHRA, which we touched on earlier, um, which said uh, the balance of benefits and risk remained favourable, caveated by the fact where other drugs were not indicated and new risk minimisation measures were put in place. As we said, the view by 2016, the MHRA did a communications exercise on the back of the review in 2015 um, and published a toolkit in 2016, was the fact that those warnings from 2014 hadn't, probably hadn't had the desired effect and that led to the review in 2018 which strengthened regulation with the aim to reduce and eliminate pregnancies exposed uh, to valparate and I think in 2016 the, the figures, the calculated figures as best you could for the number of people, number of pregnant women who were given sodium valparate was between 240 and 550 so about 0.05% of 28,000 people. Uh, of birth giving age who had uh, Valparate at that time. And that led to the pregnancy prevention program that said you could only be prescribed Valparate if the patient knew of the risks, the patient was on contraception if appropriate, and perhaps most importantly, they were reviewed by a specialist prescriber annually. As I said earlier, there was some addressing of the fact that the uh, messages and the packaging and leaflets hadn't been properly uh, publicised. General Pharmaceutical Council put out a note last autumn trying to uh, restate that information for its professionals. There were various articles that followed up in the autumn um, and uh, the MHRA and CQC I think at the moment are speaking about how the CQC through its roots can put out the messages of reinforcement. So we're trying, so I suppose to, to summarise, it was a typical treatment in the 70s and 80s. The concerns became aware in the 90s and the noughties. Uh, in the last five to six years, we've taken uh, various regulatory actions, 2014, probably not strong enough, 2018 further, to leave a de minimis number of people who are prescribed sodium valparate, but with an end point of eliminating that as a drug of choice for people who are pregnant. Yes, I think you're right to use the word choice, because some of the patients we've talked to, they have said that if they were fully informed, um, if they have been able to give proper consent, uh, they may well have actually made a different choice that was being recommended to them. And it depended on the severity of the epilepsy and the impact that um, sodium valparate uh, had on them and their lives. But I don't know if you want to pursue but that. Because this is different from Primados in the sense yes. that it is yes. a generation later. Yes. And I accept your timeline, but put it another way. It's 32 years 
since valproate was shown to be teratogenic and to cause congenital abnormalities since 12 years, up to 2014, since it was shown to cause developmental delay. That is a long time before putting out very uh, clear, specific warnings to uh, potential mothers about the risks in pregnancy prevention program. It's a long time to take to get to that position. And, uh, and as we've listened to people, we've become worried about whether or not the present situation, which is now fully in train for Valparade, is actually there to deal with other potential damage, drugs which might cause damage during pregnancy. And one we've heard of is to pyramate, uh, which is another anti-epileptic drug. And, uh, uh, and we've been told that, that it may also uh, cause teratogenic effects. And so whether that is true or not, I do not know. But are, you, are we happy that we have in place now a system for spotting early drugs that might cause uh, damage to the fetuses and to warn mothers accordingly? So, there were some health warnings actually to professionals in 83, 93, 2003 and 2013, so over 10 years, but that wasn't to mothers. Packet inserts went in in 99 and a pictogram in 17 um, before this. But I think what you're getting at is something much deeper. And I asked and was told that only five drugs are actually licensed for use during pregnancy. Um, Sorry, is that five paper left? No, no five, five drugs. drugs. Right. And what we have done in research, as you will know, is we have limited research subjects to being in the middle of age, well, young or middle age, but never children, never old. We've not used people who are feeble in any way, you know, we're, we're excluded, um, unless we are the objects of study. And we've excluded pregnant women until they're licensed and then people, the companies can go and do more RCTs. And, I, and so we've relied on teratogenic evidence and I think we should take that very seriously. But it, it does raise a question as to whether, as a global community, because this isn't a British issue, this, remember that we work as part of one of the best regulatory systems in the world, the European one and the FDA have the same issues, but what are we going to do to try and get a pharmacopoeia that works for pregnant women? Mm -hmm. So I think there's something about information and transparency, but there's something much deeper and about who's involved in research and all of that. Yeah, and, and also, it's not just about, I know, except it's not just a question of warning the profession. It's, it's the, the mother that needs to be warned. Yes. I mean, we're not no. even completely sure we've got an effective system now, which is a job site better than it was since 2014, uh, but we are, and the patient groups have been fantastic yeah. in, in bringing this to our attention, even the failure of the present system to our attention, and that we've raised with us the notion of whether there shouldn't be a register of women, so we can contact the women directly through the system, but, but so these are issues which have wider Yes. importance than Valparate, important though that is, and so uh, we need to consider how we identify early drugs that might cause damage and how can we warn the mother, not just the doctors, because, because there are a lot, pa patients have lots of doctors these days. And I do think pharmacists have, uh, could play a much bigger role. And they are doing in the Valproate prevention program. Yeah. But, but again, you're back to the person who really needs to know is the mother. But the pharmacists usually yes. have that um, dispensing role. Um, so I think there's a role there, or I thought there was a role for someone else who could help too, when it comes back. So so just, just to go back to the point that Cyril raised about pyramid. So we, we asked the NHRA about the pyramid, and it, it, it has similar where it has a teratogenic effect. I don't think there's any dispute about that. Um, and, and you'd expect a degree of consistency. So if, if we're talking about two teratogenic drugs, evaporate and pyramate, you would hope and expect that the, the approach to safety is consistent, similar, or identical. 
And I think what we've heard in relation to Pyramid <coughs> is that it's not exactly the same. What the MHRA has told us is that they, they have put in place elements, as they described it, of a pregnancy prevention program, but not all of them. So educational materials around the risks associated with Pyramid don't exist. Um, uh, the, sort of the risk profile is not, um, is not articulated in the same way. So the concern we'd have is that, I think you've touched on a, on a, on a major point about how do, we, how do we make sure that women in pregnancy are able to take medicines they need to take to treat conditions not related to their pregnancy safely. That's a major and significant one. But, but on the, uh, in terms of where we are today, consistency between these drugs that have that effect ought to be something that women can take for granted, and it doesn't seem that they can. Um, well, I don't think we can, we were still in teacher, I don't think we can comment on the second drug because uh, uh, none of us uh, have come to that. I mean, um, well, I mean, uh, in, uh, in principle, what you say is self-evidently true. Um, obviously, you would need to know the details yeah. of the effects of the individual drug and you would want uh, whatever the rules and regulations around them to be specific to the concerns around that drug and proportionate to the balance of benefit and risks. I mean, I mean, in this case, I mean, it is completely different from what we were uh, talking about before because the science in this one is not in doubt at all. Um, uh, it's obviously a drug that is only taken by people who've got some extremely serious medical condition uh, anyway, and it is one of, therefore, one of those classic um, uh, uh, challenges that our medical friends face about how do you weigh up the benefits and the risks of a particular drug, which, uh, as it's always been explained to me, there's a, there's a sort of general, uh, what is the approach to this drug, and then there's a very patient-specific, that patient with that doctor having, as you, as you started this, a proper informed consent conversation. It's the interaction of those two levels that leads you to a uh, safe system. Um, I mean, I assume the MHRA is following up the concerns you raised already. Uh, if you have raised them with them, we will, of course, check. Uh, that, but I, don't, but I don't think we can comment yeah. um, uh, uh, no, you um, can on that, on that particular I think drug. The other thing I'd say is mm. we, need a, we need a system, and I think the pregnancy prevention um, programmes one, where you have both the discussion, but you go away with something in your hand. Because my experience, both as a doctor and a patient, is you can have a good discussion, but you, you don't always remember because it's so anxious, mm. all the details. So the bit in the hand is also very important. And so we uh, need to design something that includes both. We've been thinking about the mobile phone, but in the hand, rather than something written, so that actually the consultation with the GP, in this case, or whoever, um, is recorded and then people can take that home. Mm -hmm. They can discuss it with their family and their friends and everybody else. Oh, we should have asked that question. What a shame. Go back again, and then you've got a much better informed understanding of the issue and the consultation that took place. Yeah. Now, with modern technology, that is actually very easy. Yes. And it seems to me that that is something we could be thinking about. The, the other thing I just want to say, <coughs> Dem Sally, I mean, you're right that the pharmacist has a very important part to play, but in a way they're the fallback from the GP who prescribes it. And <coughs> we've been told that one of the problems with the GPs is they have so many alerts on their system that they can't take into account all the alerts. But they have a wonderful <laughs> database in terms of the number of women who are registered with them who are of childbearing age. And I just don't know how we can actually ratchet these things up so that it becomes more important. Because yeah. we cannot have women now still taking the drug and delivering babies that are disabled. So we, we all share your concern and view. Uh, I also personally share your view about too many alerts. I'm frequently asked to sign off an alert in my name or someone else's. I mostly say no, because I think when we send an alert, and I did send one on Valproate, it's very important that it truly matters, because then it'll come through and people will see it. 
So and that's why we're reviewing the alert system because okay. there were too many and too much going on. So I hope that we will end up with a, a better system because if you're pervaded by bureaucracy, another alert is your more work. And does it percolate? But yes. I mean, this is, I mean, this is well researched, both in medicine and well, well beyond uh, the, uh, the sort of overload alert systems are just squeaked out by everybody. You know, so the warning light is always on and therefore you ignore it. Um, and we've seen that in uh, lots of transport uh, as well as uh, uh, in health. Um, I mean, again, there, I mean, there's, no, um, there's no mathematically right answer, isn't there? Because of course you have, you know, as, a, a, as, a, as, a, as a public policy person, you have pressures in both directions. Um, you have, as Sally says, lots of individual cases where a lot of people want you to issue alert for perfectly good reasons, you know, from their individual perspective. And then you have effectively a pressure to say, well, actually, if it's more than 10 a year, people stop reading them whatever it is. Now, as you can't solve those questions mathematically, it does, in the end, come down to a judgment of judgment. people like... So I have never uh, given away the right to decide on the CMO alert. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the other thing I we've been looking at, and again, this comes with the patient safety right, is of course there are um, rightly a number of people in the system who are entitled to issue uh, yeah. uh, alerts, and that's of course right. You want a diversity; you don't want it to be all the same person. Uh, but we do need to look at then how are they received? If you're getting an alert from mm. the CMO and an alert from NICE and a, you know, etc., so how you coordinate that whole system? I don't think the answer is to try and centralise everything in a single person because then you're reliant on the single person's judgment rather than a. Um, it's not a market, but you know what I mean. It's uh, you know having a diversity of people who are looking, but you then have to make it understandable to your GP, who is receiving things from different people on uh, slightly different bases. So, uh, which is why it's right to look at uh, uh, all these things. Other lessons do you think that we've learned from this in terms of other other actions we should be taking to prevent this sort of thing happening in the future? Um, well, I think some of the biggest ones, I'll let William comment and look at this in much more detail, um, I mean some, uh, some of the biggest ones uh, have been mentioned uh, already. Um, the who are you actually communicating with question, um, uh, I think is a very big one uh, for us and uh, as you've already described, um, the traditional uh, view of one well, I mean, not just our system, all health systems, is the communication route is solely down the professional channel um, and uh, you are essentially trusting each doctor to pass on the relevant communication uh, to the patient. Uh, I think for the reasons we've described, um, clearly the professional route is vital but it can't be uh, the uh, only one, partly for the reason you say uh, around um, uh, you don't always see the same doctor but also by definition, that will be build variability into the uh, message, as any um, uh, to disaggregated system of communication uh, would. So I think there's a big learning point from the story you tell about the direct communication, which comes back to what we were talking about before, about treating people like um, uh, 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 adults who can uh, take all these uh, messages. So that's a big uh, lesson. What would, what would you uh, the other two things I was going to add to was going back onto the horizontal point. There's a question of having put out the alert. Do you, are, is, is the impact of the alert actually measured? Do you actually know mm -hmm. if it's been received and comply? Which might sound like an incredibly obvious thing, uh, but I mean it was certainly one of the challenges that Jeremy Hunt put back to us was if you put things out, what's the follow up about the impact afterwards? And I think the committee that Chris was describing is is thinking about whether it has those mechanisms uh, built into its activity. Mm. So, I'll just put in on that because yeah. it's a very important point because it goes with the small numbers. Of course, if you have a small number of alerts, it is perfectly possible to track did everyone do those 10. If you have a very wide system of alerts, it becomes close to impossible without overwhelming mm. people. They not only have to implement the report, <laughs> but, but also have to then validate that they have done so, because there is a balance in there. So I've sent out 102 since May 2010. When I look at what they are, they cover really important things. The use of antivirals every year, turning them on and turning them off for flu, valproate, safe transfusion, shortage of adult hepatitis, B, 
pseudomonas infections associated with cartilage ear piercing, deaths due to consumption of DMP, you know, fentanyl contaminated heroin, um, polio outbreak in Tajikistan. So they they are quite selective, but for I think antibiotic resistant. I haven't found an excuse to send one. <laughs> You don't know other I, I think William, you yeah, sorry, William, you've got to say something. Yeah, the only other thing I was going to say was obviously, I mean, going back to the earlier theme, if you have each of the individual organisations who is contributing to these um, alerts, that they do have a patient and public involvement read into that at the outset, then you probably get a better uh, balanced message in the alert. And I know one of the things that the MHRA is looking at is, is appointing a director to do just that, so that then becomes integral to their day-to-day -day activity and then gets reflected in how the messages get put out because clearly, as you all say before, if you have that as a tag on afterwards, you've missed the point, whereas if you have it integral at the start, it's more likely to have a resonance with the public and it may well affect some of the things that the public have been saying along the way. Can I, can I just raise a slightly different issue in relation yeah. to the outbreak, which is that a lot of the families that we've met have spoken to us about the difficulty they have in accessing the support they need from not just the healthcare system but also the social care system, uh, even though they've got a child who's, well, and in some cases, in many cases, more than one child who's affected by a fetal outbreak spectrum disorder. And part of the problem that they have is that the disorder is not formally recognised by the system. It's not seen as a condition by many uh, in, within the system, many practitioners and others within the system, and even in the case of in applying for benefits, for example, they, they bump into a problem, a very significant problem, because it's not recognised as a condition. Has well, two points: a is the department aware of that problem, and, if, and b, if so, have you been able to do anything to try and tackle it? So I became aware by reading this rather complex um, thing. So there are two issues. One, um, of course, the system basically runs on the International Classification of Diseases, I think they're on ICD-11, but I can't remember, which is set up by the WHO. And having tried to get them to listen to something else on behalf of patients, I failed. Um, they have a system, they work it, and they throw it at us. So that then means we can't get a formal ICD-11 classification in all likelihood, but how do we put it into our system? And I haven't known that until I read this, and I think it is a discussion we would have to take away. Um, but actually, the more the families can talk about <coughs> it in the media, the more people hear it, and then it becomes common parlance, then the easier it is to do it. And I mean, the other thing that is available, and I know this is, um, this is obviously after the event, that people can go through the <coughs> special educational needs process to get support from local authorities to help with educational needs to deriving from these cases, so there is that as well. Which is of course now combined yes. with health. Yes, which is now something that's coming to our department. Yes, I mean that we've, obviously families have spoken to us about that pathway that they have to go through and it's challenging for them. Because yeah. Because yeah. it is not, uh, for the reasons we've discussed, it's not a recognised condition, there are different elements to, diff different symptoms if you like of the condition mm -hmm. and for example autism, so a, a, a child may well get considered in the context of autism rather than fetal outbreak spectrum disorder, of which autism can be not an easy part. Of yes. So, so, they, so the system, and this, is apply, this applies in education as much as in health and social care, the system will look at that aspect without seeing a bigger picture that the family sees. Yeah, I mean, having run both the education department and the health department, um, at, um, uh, this is a challenging system for everybody. Um, but, um, and um, I mean, we do think we have made a lot of progress about bringing together um, educational and special education needs assessments with health assessments into a single system, but I don't think anyone would say that um, uh, that progress is finished or that the system is user friendly, as it were. So many people find navigating that system very challenging, regardless of the condition, what you're bringing to the table is that there are some additional challenges with this particular thing which we will take away. Um, so, uh, I mean, again, in an area we do think we are uh, better than we were, but we are in no way uh, uh, suffering under the belief that the system works. 
uh, to the benefit of everybody uh, yet. So Chris, can I finally ask you to take away something that I didn't think I'd have the opportunity to raise today, but yeah. suddenly uh, a gap has opened up and I can't stop myself <laughs> going through it. Yeah. Um, these families have to work under huge stress. Some of that stress is about the benefit system. That's not what we're going to talk about today. Yeah. They have problems about getting the specialist help they need, and we're talking to NHS England about that. But getting education linked to health is yep. a real problem yep. for children with long-term conditions. Yes. Now, we were involved, uh, Baroness Cummins and I, on the policy board when the NHS number was introduced. Yep. I Which is different from the education number. I know, <laughs> you know better than I do. Yeah. But we finally persuaded uh, yeah. local authorities and social services to use it for child protection purposes. Yeah. But we've completely failed, I and others, and there's yeah. a group of us, and it's nothing to do with this, to get the Department of Education to record the NHS number in schools. So with permission, under proper circumstances, we can link the health and education needs of children with asthma, epilepsy, valparate, and other long-term conditions. So it would be such a help. Now, I, I don't will, expect uh, to I will take to that up with my former uh, colleagues. Uh, uh, indeed. Uh, now, um, uh, yes, I mean, um, uh, um, uh, um, I was about to say in defence of my former department, but um, at, um, uh, I think this is one of those situations, and as you cross from education to health, you find this. Uh, both sides, and they shouldn't be sides, but they are find the other very frustrating to deal with. Um, yes. Well, and, I've spoken um, to your yes. successor. Yes. Uh, um, and however, and the, if between the, the two of you, the issue you raise is exactly the right one. There will yes. be lots of uh, yes clapping. Yeah, that. and um, yes, I mean, and um, and we made quite a lot of progress um, at, uh, in the aggregate, but not in the individual. So we are much better. Um, at uh, linking up uh, anonymised data sets and being able to see trends. Well, I, that different. is not the problem. You, yeah, exactly. That Doing it at the problem. individual level. I mean, I, I mean, you know all the. And there is a review, review which yes. I think maybe yes. I will. Um, I, will I will take it up with review. my successor because, as okay. you say, um, it would make everyone's life uh, uh, easier. So, Sarah, uh, never this is an opportunity. No, to well, it's take uh, up an opportunity. Uh, so it's what we're here for. That's good. Um, can we move on now to surgical meds, yes. um, which uh, <coughs> again we've had um, a huge number of women who have suffered from this uh, in Scotland, <coughs> in Wales and in Northern Ireland, uh, but particularly of course throughout England. And, and one of the things that really has concerned us has been the enormous amount of suffering that we have heard and the way that women are in such, such difficult situations in terms of their health and the agony that they are suffering at the moment and the fact that <clears throat> later on they have to give up their work having given up their work they then find it hard to pay the mortgage having uh, possibly the great dangers of losing their accommodation uh, they then have problems in terms of people get very interested in their children and whether they are able to bring up their children so this is an issue that has horrific consequences and uh, we have heard as i said from hundreds and hundreds of women around the country and through emails and the office has been extremely busy responding to concerns now it's really had a 20-year history and the interesting thing about history is how it really had such a rapid rise and then there has been fewer um, surgical operations made, partly through the pause, but anyhow we know that uh, the numbers were beginning to go down. But just thinking about the history of this great tragedy that's happened, um, I'm just wondering if you've got any advice for us. Um, how could we avoid something like that happening in the future? Um, yes, well, I mean, I'll leave my colleagues to comment on your direct question. I mean, I mean, obviously we've seen many of the same testimonies as you and as, uh, as so often with these 
inquiries, it's impossible not to find them uh, both intensely moving and deeply harrowing. I mean, we've seen this in other inquiries on the national television, and um, uh, and obviously uh, uh, no one in the system wants to see uh, those kind of stories as a result of um, uh, things that were supposed to help. You know, that's not what we're all uh, uh, for. And I think if everyone who has seen the kind of uh, uh, things that uh, uh, you have described has been, um, I'm not quite sure what the right word is, touched in the same way that you describe. Um, and obviously, uh, when um, uh, 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 people are harmed, we have to do everything we can to uh, 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 to put that right. Um, on the what can we learn? I'll go and turn to uh, uh, Chief Medical Officer first, but also uh, uh, William. This is absolutely horrible. Sorry? This is absolutely horrible, those poor women, the impact on their relationships and families. We, we all feel unhappy and saddened. Um, I think we have a number of issues at play. First of all, as I inquired about this, I learnt uh, that there are women who get to the end of their tether with their incompetence or prolapse who can benefit from an appropriate operation by an experienced operator. And so clearly, uh, and if you look at the Scottish Review, there are equivalent <coughs> numbers of women who were, had good outcomes and think it's a good thing. Clearly, therefore, it is something we want to keep on the books. So what is the issue? And the issue um, seems to me to come back to two things. Transparency, information, consent, that block of things, and trust between patients and doctors, uh, and were the doctors properly trained up to it, and what were their side effects? One of the driving reasons that I persuaded government to set up NIHR, why I wanted to do it, was because I felt um, strongly, as I've already said, that the public don't understand the balance between um, an intervention and the risks, but that actually we needed to get much more into surgery and the interventional things. And I, um, I found a quote from now temporarily lost, but there was saying the ones who are worst are looking at the outcomes of the obstetricians and gynaecologists, and we still haven't learned. And what, so I think, what I'm frankly horrified is the lack of understanding by the operators of the general of the op outcomes of the operations and they're not evaluating, monitoring and evaluation. I mean, I used to audit the outcomes of my own practice and get other people to check I was doing it properly. You know, they weren't doing that, let alone applying for the trials when we had the money. So they weren't able to tell how they were doing, let alone putting it together as a specialist group or something, and then being able to say to patients, so I mean I'm sure this is another one where there'd be a learning curve, but were they going as a the beginning of laparoscopic surgery to centres to learn it from the best and practising with an experienced operator? It doesn't sound like it. And so I, I think that it's spread because it seemed to be a quick fix, and for a number of women, it gave them relief. But for too many, without expecting it, they have ended up with a disastrous outcome. Has the um, manufacturing industry, has that had an impact in terms of the very um, sharp rise in the use of uh, mesh. Uh, have there been um, issues that you have come across on persuasion or marketing? Or I haven't, and I think things have changed a lot. The ABPI set the standards by, you know, not agreeing not to sponsor a lot of educational meetings and trips and things like that. And the a the devices industry usually follow them. I'd have to go and check what their advice is, but there's much less of that been going on over the last 10 years. Um, maybe I'm not the one to ask, but there is much less. 
But there's peer pressure, you know, they meet at meetings, we meet at meetings, so I am a doctor, I'm part of the tribe, you know, have you tried this, it seems to work. And I think what seems to have happened is they didn't check up, and that brings in the value of PRUMS, patient reported outcome measures, because if they'd been doing that, they would have known that the outcome for some of the women wasn't good enough. They did. I'm just gobsmacked yes. at the lack of looking at their own practice. Who, who should have done that um, uh, post-marketing surveillance? Um, who is within the system to do it? I, in drugs, of course, pharmaceutical companies have to. We have a yellow card system, and MHRA keeps an yeah. eye on it. I, is it the same for devices? Sorry, uh, sure. Well, devices is slightly different because they come from a Notified European body. starting point and they, they move yeah. in and out of the market much more often. So it is basically the MHRA through the yellow card and the uh, reports it gets back from manufacturers, which is the way of picking up uh, some of these problems. Can I have two other things to, to what your original question was? And obviously, as, as the others have said, you know, I've watched some of the uh, patient testimonies here at the hearings. And it's you know very harrowing, and you wouldn't you wouldn't want anybody to suffer in that way. Um, I mean, the two things that I think probably haven't happened quickly enough is is first of all the question of data, which was first raised as an issue in 2003, uh, and in 2018 we got the first cut of data looking at the previous 10 years practice, just an analysis of the figures, nothing more. So clearly that is a sort of un unacceptably long lag. And the second thing, which is going back to the thing of the earlier discussions is the whole question about um, understanding the patient experience and hearing from the position of those who have had the treatment. I say those who have had the treatment because obviously if you look at the Scottish report from last year, which is small scale but is probably the best we've got at the moment, you know, there's, there's lots of people expressing things that can hold as truths together. Some patients saying, as we know, that uh, it caused um, difficulties in terms of personal relationships and in terms of sense of self-esteem, uh, a feeling that that wasn't always recognised in the interaction with the clinician. Another group of people saying that they had positive outcomes in, in similar numbers to the people who haven't. That doesn't belittle the people who haven't, but it shows the complexity of the issue. And probably more importantly than either is that most people, even in that survey, didn't share a particular opinion. So there may be a question about how, uh, uh, as, as well as getting the medical side of the, de the debate to, to listen carefully, that we encourage people to be able to speak out about what their experiences of these treatments are. Because obviously with something like MESH, it is a surgical procedure, but it, has, uh, you know, it can have pretty fundamental personal and social impacts as well. And allowing people to speak about both of those is probably a way of better informing the system. So all the systemic things we were talking about earlier actually have a richer inflow of information mm. over time. So data Can I pick up on that dialogue. one? Oh, I was going to add. Yeah, you, 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 you go first and then I'll... I mean, I absolutely agree. Of course I agree. But we are in an area where none of us like talking about it. I did an annual report on women's health, which was published in um, 20, uh, December 2015, and I actually did focus on incontinence. And as I talked about it on the Today program, mm -hmm. I mean, the Today presenters were quite horrified, were even more horrified when I moved on to sex, but that's not today's issue. But I was just gobsmacked by how prevalent incontinence is in older women, particularly those postpartum, um, and how women don't talk about it. And then I thought, yes, but I don't talk about the problems I had after childbirth. Um, so I did talk about it, as you know, publicly on a, uh, on a, a Facebook Live um, and got some quite unpleasant um, letters as a result. Mm -hmm. So I think we want people to talk about it, but we need to give them a safe space to talk about these very personal issues. No, I, I do agree with that. Yes. Uh, the things that I was going to add was a completely different flavour of um, uh, comment, and I, and, I, and, I, and I think many of the things I'm going to say, I think uh, the MHRA has said to you already, but I thought I'd emphasise. I mean, uh, there, uh, we do have 
as a system a much greater challenge regulating devices than uh, medicines, partly because we have a much longer track record, but particularly <coughs> uh, the point that the Chief Medical Officer raised earlier, that the obviously clearly the interaction of the product and the skill of the person using the product is much more fundamental to whether it is safe than in most prescriptions. Because we do have issues with prescriptions and medicines. But that question of when you have a problem, is it the product that needs better regulation? The people who are using the product incorrectly, the better regulation, or potentially both, is a much more complex system and, of course, runs directly into uh, the issue Cyril and I were talking about right at the beginning of um, we have always split the regulation of products from the regulation of individuals and most people think that is the right thing but in these areas you have to have a way of doing the two simultaneous which simply is more challenging mm -hmm. um, which is n not an attempt and an excuse at the things that have happened but to recognise we have a much bigger journey to go around that than you do on a sort of classic medicine. I mean our thinking is, uh, yeah. is getting quite a long way along the line over this. Yeah. But it does represent an example of something we discussed right at the start of this yeah. session, and that is the cross-linkage yes. difficulties. Exactly. Because it was in 2003 or 2004 yes. that NICE yes. recommended yeah. that there should be a register. Now, in other areas, I was looked after children with kidney failure, we had a register yeah. to make sure we could follow up uh, the outcomes. Uh, NICE recommended it, but NICE doesn't affect it. Yes. And so when we've spoken to people about this, each part has been able to do yeah. it, but it's not actually linked. So they make a recommendation, but they don't do. Yeah. The people who do don't necessarily take the recommendation. And yeah. so that yeah. is an issue that obviously has to be addressed. Yeah. But what we do know, and we've made progress on this, is that one way th to do this is to have proper registers, not for everything, but for particularly interventions, which are new in the College of Surgeons have given advice about this recently. And in the conversation we've had outside this meeting, we seem to be making good progress in the notion of what is a database, what is a registry, yeah. how to do that with GDPR and all the rest of it. Yeah. That, I think, is going to be crucial, because we've got to have uh, registries which are just not anonymized but with, with proper uh, safeguards are patient identifiable so that we can deal with the issues related to the things which are unexpected. It's not just about clinical success, it's about the patient related outcomes, the patient experience. Up and down the country we've met women who said actually my operation was a success in the sense that I'm now continent but my life is destroyed. I'm in pain. I have dyspareunia. My relationships have gone. All that sort of thing. So we've got to be able to interrogate databases with proper permission so that we can learn before it's too late. Yes. Um, well, I, I, I have one more thing to say on the balance discussion, but I'll let William, as he uh, did, we, we recognise this as a vital issue. I'll let William yeah, so do that, and then I'll come back. I if mean, that's registries, okay. as you say, is, is a complicated issue. We made some money available last year which has now gone to 1.1 million. 1 million. million to start uh, the development of, of a registry. The question is uh, how many registries do you have to what extent and how can you organise them in a way that you quickly collect the data and you're trading that off against the you know the overall infrastructure that you're establishing. Now I know that that is work is, that is ongoing and obviously, as the review reports, we you know we will be very interested to hear about where you land in terms of making registries effective, and in a sense, I suppose moving them, if I'm summarising in broad terms, from a position where they're they're professionally led with the best of intentions, they quite often don't have the infrastructure around them to enable them to make Indeed. an impact in the system. And then thirdly, the way that the data is effectively translated into the other bodies. Fortunately, there are international examples which we can learn from. Uh, and yes. I think it's very important yes. to the National Health Service that we do try to learn from people elsewhere who do things better. Yes. So and the Swedes are clearly people we should learn from. Um, and the Danes. I've been on the edge of the registry debate for most <coughs> of my professional life. 
And I think we've got to find the right balance between collecting enough that we can reasonably go back to patients if we have a concern. So one of the first emergencies I had to deal with was the PIP breast implants. We didn't know who had had what. Um, and then there's what data do you collect? So the more we can do through the electronic patient record of knowing what's implanted, and then you say, right, well, this is new. Let's survey those patients and get some data to find out if it's all right. Or, hey, we're concerned about this. We can let these patients know through yes, their well, doctors. We, we will have recommendations to make. Yeah, this, uh, the better. One of the problems here is that, and again, this, this, this is reflecting what women have told us, that they feel like they're the guinea pigs in a trial. Because but they weren't in a trial. I mean, that's part of my concern. Well, if they'd only been no, in a trial, was, we'd have the answer. There was no formal trial, exactly. Yeah. But, but the product was introduced into the market, as Baroness Cumbridge has said, there was sharp uptake in the use of that product. It was introduced into the market with minimal awareness of what its long-term effects, or even short-term effects, would be on, on women. And the way we, the system, has found out is through those women's experience. Is there something fundamentally wrong in that? Yes, because I think leading on from that, I just wonder how the department uh, satisfied itself that mesh was safe for use. Well, it went through, ultimately through the routine notified body system, so... Um, but it didn't work. Well, it does work for some women. Um, there are nasty side effects and it's been misused or misput in by some surgeons. That, I mean, I think that's why we have to distinguish what it, uh, all the different issues. We, sorry, just to interrupt, we, 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 that's true, but we also don't know what the long-term effects of this product in the human body are. Is that right? Um, I agree, though, I suppose I'd say that there are meshes that have been used for long term. I mean, you know, aortic... Um, but in the pelvis. ...bifurcation graph. Yes, no, I, I absolutely accept. But that then argues for much more discussion and transparency, doesn't it? Because there will be some people who say, well, if, it, if that sort of mesh has been used for years or it's been put into rats for hundreds of days or until they die with no side effects, then I'm going to take that, that hope. Yeah, and come I think come you made about yeah. um, consent, actually. That yeah. The consent should be about making sure the, the patient, the woman in this situation, knows what the system knows, yes. but also knows what, what the system, system doesn't, doesn't know. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, that hasn't happened. But yes. Yeah, I mean, this is exactly the point I was going to make. And, and, um, and as I said, we recognise, and MHRA recognise that in devices, um, that system has got a lot further to travel than medicines. Or as you say, there were uh, uh, lots, of, uh, uh, lots of history. We, we of course, face the dual pressure. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, rightly uh, the questions that you're raising um, about should there have been more trials. And uh, uh, I'd have liked some, a trial. Yes, exactly. Um, mm. And, uh, and yes, uh, we also, um, in real time, uh, have intense pressure of why has X, which could help people who are in very difficult situations, not been implemented yet. Um, to which our answers are the ones you've just given us um, very frequently, as, as, uh, 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 as you will know. That yes, this does look promising, but. It hasn't been properly tested and it hasn't had the OCT and etc. We have examples of those right now. And they are, of course, very, very difficult balances when you have a patient who's, you know, who could be helped by something you've got in your hand, but you do not yet have the confidence to use generally. And that is the kind of things, unfortunately, we have to, uh, we have to balance up. But as I say, um, we are not um, um, uh, defensive at all about this question of uh, we and indeed the world uh, need to learn a lot more about how do you best um, regulate uh, that sort of combination of medical devices and... Are you content with the new EU medical device regulations which are coming in? Um, we think they are a step forward. Well, um, is there anything more you think should be done in addition to that? Uh, what would you say, William? I don't know the answer to that, I'm going to be perfectly honest. Um, no, well, that, I mean, our focus has been on implementing the regulations we've got. If um, you think of things then, yeah. William, would you let us know? Yes. But yeah. you're looking only at the regulatory bit. You have to look at the professional yeah. bit. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, if I can go back to your yes. the, the point you made about no, no, I don't, well, I, just I, to I pick up the, the CMO's yeah. point, uh, we are absolutely looking at that, uh, which is uh, we are talking about making sure that when people undertake a procedure, they're competent to do it. And they are competent to know what to do if it goes wrong. Because the person who puts the mesh in may not be skilled at taking it out, but therefore they need to work within teams which are properly that I don't use words that have uh, too many exact meanings because there are issues to be discussed here. But certainly we want to have specialist centers where you know that your, your, the center itself is competent and safe and it's working with people as a part of multidisciplinary teams. No, we're absolutely onto that because yeah. we've heard up and down the country from women where, frankly, they have been poorly informed and poorly treated. Yeah, and uh, I, mean, I, think, yeah. I guess I think we'd agree uh, with uh, uh, all that. Um, th the only thing, and this is the point I was going to make uh, to your previous question, Baroness, um, there is also a thing about not losing what is wonderful about the medical uh, profession. So when I um, uh, uh, when I was not in health, uh, we used to look with envy uh, about how ideas spread in the medical profession so fast on your uptake question. And we always looked at you know, something like keyhole surgery, which spreads across the world to the benefit of you without any government doing anything. No. And that's the huge strength of the medical professional culture. The question you're raising is, what happens when you get that kind of spread on something which is really hard to use? And I'm aware of it, but I have yes. an artificial heart now. So yes. I really am yes. in favour of, of yes. new devices being properly... No, exactly. And, 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 and the way the medical professions are able to pick up ideas and spread them and use them, and, as I say, without governments doing anything, as but opposed to... First do no harm. But first do no harm. Uh, to, um, obviously, that support. culture you want to protect while dealing with all the questions that you're, uh, uh, that you're raising. But we do handle drugs differently. So if you look at the debate about warfarin versus the new anticoagulants, we all thought the new anticoagulants were more expensive but would be much safer. And the latest studies show that it, they're not universally safer. Yes. Um, so so, so yeah. I absolutely accept that. And the thing is with drugs, you can change it. You can alter the dose or the type of drug or whatever. Yes. Yeah. No, the we trouble agree. with surgical mesh has been that it was inserted with the intention it would be in the body for life. And one of the issues that have come up very strongly for us is that the women who want it taken out are finding it very difficult to get surgeons who will do that with the skills that are necessary. And we know the terrible, terrible issues when the mesh gravitates and it goes around other organs and all the rest of it. So in some ways it is so different. And that is why we have to be really careful about future devices. And I accept William's point. They are very different. But the department was advised to create a statutory body that was very similar to the Committee for the Safety of Medicines. And that was for new interventional procedures. But instead, it created the voluntary CERNIP. Mm. And, you know, that really has been a failure. And the way that the CERNIP acted was to change even the rating of the manufacturers for the different mesh devices. And we were told that some of that change was because of whose uh, subsidiary put pressure on CERNIP. Now, I, I just wonder, why did the department do that? because they had an opportunity to have something that was statutory and yet they had a voluntary system that was very much um, guided by the Royal Colleges etc who, who don't have the um, statutory authority to actually bring in certain measures that are necessary. So can it I seemed to me a very odd decision. Can I pick up on that and a couple of points of information that you, you were asking us earlier? So, I mean. Certainly, as you say, was something a bit like the discussion we've been having on registries a moment ago. It was something that was voluntary, was set up by the Royal Colleges, didn't have too much data or money attached. 
and uh, that function was transferred over to NICE to try and put it on a more consistent footing uh, and led to the interventional procedures guidance that NICE now uh, produces. So the aim of that was to make uh, those advices more mainstream to the health service rather than less that they might have been under CERNIP. Um, in terms of how we uh, monitor devices um, once they've been uh, produced onto the market, it is the MHRA who do the post-market surveillance alongside uh, the manufacturers. And in terms of the new processes that are coming in for medical devices regulations from the EU which come in between now and 2020, uh, they're trying to do a number of things that we've, we've been touching on, raising the threshold of clinical evidence required for the device, the point you were making about MESH, the requirements and scrutiny placed on notified bodies to look at how they're performing, the traceability of devices, uh, and the information that is available to patients and clinicians. So I think that is, uh, we, we will clearly have to see how it pans out and we'll clearly have to see what you say in response to your analysis of the issues. But I think that is starting to pick up some of the major issues that presently distinguish the devices approach from uh, the medicines approach and will bring uh, a greater degree of commonality. But NICE doesn't have statutory powers. No. It only NICE, offers guidance. No. NICE, so uh, th that, is, that is a fair point. Um, why doesn't NICE do that? Um, it is advice, it is fairly strong advice, but clearly it gets you back to the conundrum that we've all been discussing, which it is still advice to give to a doctor and hopefully their patient about what is going to be best in the individual instance. So it necessarily leaves discretion for that discussion. That's fine. The question then goes on to, for example, the interventional procedures. How can you make sure the right level of uh, known information is then injected into that conversation to give it a consistency. I mean, that's the whole reason why NICE was established 20 years ago, was to try and give some consistency of clinical and cost effectiveness. At the time it was introduced, there were lots of arguments about it would be the death of professionalism and all the rest of it, and people wouldn't have any discretion. And actually, it's given a much greater consistency to anybody uh, who is, say, giving mesh out that it is available to them, and hopefully gives a basis for a better conversation uh, with the individual concerned. So I think. There are quite good reasons why NICE guidance is voluntary, but that, that is no reason to say that people can't be better informed about the guidance and it can't be more firmly put out so that people have the best knowledge at both levels in the conversation. If, if, you, if their 2003 recommendations on MESH had been followed, which were uncannily similar to the recommendations that Sir Bruce Keogh made in his letter of 2012, there are probably hundreds, certainly hundreds, possibly many thousands of women who wouldn't have suffered the way that they have. So something, there's something structurally wrong there that NICE identified practice that should be adhered to and they weren't listened to. I think that uh, I think that is a challenge. Uh, we need to take that away. We need to hear what you've got to say, and clearly the question about how you translate the advice and the, uh, uh, the best position on an issue and how you take that out into practice is is something that we're going to have to go away and do more work on. I agree. Yeah, I think what I'd add. I mean, I think um, I think your question is very fair. Uh, clearly, uh, uh, that course of events is not what anyone wanted and led to the effect that you uh, uh, had. Um, we have had, however, many instances where as were, what you might call the NICE approach has been highly effective and it's generally seen as a world leading body and lots of people copy it and there was a lot of power to that sort of professional guidance uh, approach. Likewise, we've seen uh, situations where you have a set of statutory rules uh, where exactly the same happens. Um, because the real problem is in the implementation, not in the statutory force or otherwise. But well, can I interrupt you? So if there's an advisory arm, yeah. Uh, yeah. then there needs to be an effector arm. Oh, yeah. No, Doesn't sorry, this is, um, this is exactly and, what I was going to You know, the CERN yeah. decision, yes. um, I'd like to think, wouldn't happen today. Yes. <coughs> yeah. No, sorry, this is exactly where I was going. Uh, you can make a case in these cases, and it's an arguable thing, you know, so I'm not attempting to 
uh, prejudge the answer, uh, either for the guidance approach or the statutory approach. But what Cyril has just described is more important than both of them, um, which is regardless of which it is, how does it actually practically affect what an individual How do you know if it's worked? Yeah. Now, um, now this comes... How are you going to make it work? How do you know if it's Exactly. Uh, now, this comes both to the list of things that um, uh, uh, William was describing, both of do you know if it was done and then do you know the effect? Um, and, and I won't repeat them, the discussions we're having before, is there actually a person, um, and this is what we're trying to create with the National Patient Safety Director, who believes it is their job um, to be constantly scanning the horizon for what's going right, what's going wrong, what are the things where NICE has made a recommendation but it's not happening, etc. So there is an awful lot of processes, things you can do that will improve the situation, but it does all come back to the point you first raised about having data to actually track okay. what is happening well, and therefore to intervene. So, so personally on these things, I have, oh, sorry, am I delaying <laughs> CMO? I, I, you know, whether statutory is better or guidance is better is a debatable thing and it is fair to debate, but it shouldn't distract us from that set of questions. Can, can I, I mean. just finally ask, uh, very quickly, because I know other people have got commitments they've got to get to. Uh, is it now appropriate, do you think, to consider a statement of regret? Um, I think whether um, uh, in all these cases, um, I think what ministers will want to do um, is uh, uh, receive your report and recommendations um, and, uh, uh, and decide what to do in that and, uh, and many other areas uh, based on uh, what you say. I mean, it's an obvious truism that uh, if you are going to uh, set up an inquiry and uh, 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 have people such as yourself devoting their time to doing it, you should listen uh, to what they say before you take uh, uh, those uh, decisions. There, but for the grace of God, go I. I feel intensely sad about all this. Sorry? I feel intensely sad about this. And so you do feel that there should be a statement of regret? I think that is for ministers to decide. It's not mine. Yes, and as I say, I think ministers mm -hmm. will want to be advised and by William, the inquiry I about Well, I, I'd say the same thing. I mean, particularly serious point that I'm the Commissioner of the Review on behalf of the Department. We really need to hear the totality of what people have to say and then. Uh, ministers will respond accordingly. Mm, right. Well, I absolutely understand what you're saying, uh, Sir Chris, that you know it's up to ministers, etc. No, no, sorry, I'm not, uh, that, that, and that is not an attempt to. I just uh, thought yeah, sorry, I'm just saying that it, it, it's more, um, yes, well, as I say, as the commissioners, it, it, it's quite difficult for us to answer that question. I think, as a general principle, um, as I say, if you are going to ask people such as yourself to review something, it's very important to listen to your final word and then decide. I think that is what our ministers will want to do. I mean, as, as I hope you've gathered, I mean, um, um, uh, our, our interest uh, here is to get to the best uh, conceivable uh, outcome and um, uh, on behalf of patients um, and while we do think, um, this is particularly uh, uh, a lot of Williams' uh, work, that over the last five or six years we have made huge progress across a whole range of safety issues, um, we are, and I hope this has come over, completely open to you not only can always go further but should uh, always uh, go further. And indeed, my executive committee, we were discussing this um, uh, earlier uh, earlier today. So, I, I mean, I hope that is the impression that we have given of you. Okay. As I say, that we are uh, proud of many of the things we have done over the last few years, but that is not the same as saying we think we have a perfect system, or that there aren't big issues that continue to be need to be addressed, and that history is a great guide uh, to that. So we are... Um, uh, uh, very much looking forward to seeing both your recommendations and the work we've described of the National Safety Director with the aim uh, of hopefully being able to crack these issues and, as you said right at the beginning, ensure that um, uh, uh, they don't uh, happen again. So I hope that is the impression well, Chris, Thank you so much. Thank you for coming and with your colleagues here today. And um, we, I'm sure we'll be in contact, uh, especially when we come to implementation. But clearly, yes. you will want to see the report. Uh, we you will. Make any yes, decisions and, um, and for further, if you well, have further you. questions, we remain at your service. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very much.